I'm John Bowden from Rocky Street Music. It just occurred to me that we have never put up the entire Dennis DeYoung interview that we did a little over a year ago. Dennis talks about the high and low points of being in sticks, how he'd love to be back in sticks, his thoughts on Larry Gowan, their current lead singer, and so much more. This is juicy stuff. Our entire interview with Dennis DeYoung on Rock History Music. By the way, so what's this? Re- so is there a, is there retirement coming here? Rumors of my demise have been uh, uh, exaggerated by me. Um, I just said, John, I don't want to make any more albums. I said, this is it. I had to be talked into doing this by Jim Peterick. I think you probably know the story somewhat. You don't, your listeners don't. He's on Frontiers Records. The guy, Serfino, offered me a record deal in 2017 or something. And I, he says, I want you to, Dennis, Dennis, I beg you, please. He's Italian. Um, <clears throat> he wants me to make him a studio album. I said, why? Why would I do that? Because, you know, John, the music business is shite. It's pointless. And you know what a schmuck is? That's somebody who pays for something they get for free. That's a schmuck. And that's what it's turned into being. So I thought, no, a lot of work. They're going to want a thing that sounds like sticks. I'm the guy that knows how to do that, which means I'm going to have to mix it and produce it. I thought, um, uh, no thanks. And then Peterick, he lives three blocks from me. Mm-hmm. You know, Jim Peterick from Survivor and Hides of My. Three blocks from me, which, which is why I'm in a gated community. Who needs him coming over? <laughs> uh, he said, Dan, Dan, the, the world needs your music. I said, have him text me. So he sent me a song. And I said, that's cool. Help me finish it. Because if you don't have songs, here's a memo. This sounds arrogant. Now, I don't, by the way, if you don't like me, I'm 74. I don't care. I don't care anymore. You don't like me? Write all you want on there. Oh, he's a poopoo face. But you should know what I think of you. I don't care. So Jim says, help me finish the song. I said, well, it's a nice song. But if you can't write great songs, go to barber college. Stop just giving people music because it's music. There's a difference between music and songwriting. Songwriters are a very special breed. Okay. And I don't just say that because I'm one of them, but I didn't know that when I first started because I, I, the only reason I started writing songs was because we hit, we got a record deal. I had to learn how to write them. I was in a cover band. I would imitate, I imitated Robert Plant. I wasn't writing songs. So over time I figured, Oh Yeah. And something I should have known, because the reason the Beatles are so great in my mind is because they said, Sergeant Pepper, they said, and a little bit of Revolver, but mostly Sergeant Pepper, said, do anything you like, musicians, as long as it's good and the song is good. That's what they said. And I went, yeah, that's right. Okay, now writing songs is hard because there's guys that can play a million notes better than you, John, or me. They can stand under their head and play with their teeth or anything. Songwriters are... I don't know what makes a songwriter because songwriting is a mystery. Every songwriter will tell you they don't know how they do it. They just don't because we do know one thing. You might want to spend a little time, put a little time in to see if you can come up with one. But when you're doing it and something, it almost seems like magic that something came and you said, well, you know what? Here's the problem. I didn't know that until just now. (laughs) So how could I have possibly known that? How could I have done that if I didn't know it? You know, it's like when you're going to go to fix your faucet. If you don't know how to do it, you're probably going to have to call a plumber. But with songwriting, you suddenly go, what? How did that happen? You don't know. And so when you do it, you're always paralyzed with fear that you'll never be able to do it again. This is the songwriter's dilemma. And um, but songs are everything. So when Jim says, well, let's do it. I said, not without songs. And so I told him right, right from the beginning, I says, this will be a concept album. And the concept is don't suck. Don't suck, man. Don't, don't make crappy songs. Don't do anything to, you see this thing behind me? You see that wall? Don't do anything to disgrace that. Mm-hmm. So people can say, yeah, you know what? Michael Jordan got fat. Dennis Dang should stop singing. 
See, you don't want to get into that thing. Now, you think that's impressive back there? You see where it goes? It goes on. I'll tell you why it's impressive. Thank you. Wow. Because, because that's a green screen of Sting's powder room. That's the whole light is back there. That's not real. So uh, Jim and I, he, he sent me a second song. One got on the first uh, volume and one got on the second volume because I went, all right, let's see if we can finish them. Mm -hmm. And then we had eight songs like this, eight songs. You, but you were 17 in 64, that first song, Hello, Goodbye. You, I mean, you were, see, I was seven and, and I didn't get it right till I got quite a bit older. But did it really, was it a lightning bolt that hit you with the Beatles in 64? Where, the, like everyone says, I wasn't there. So uh, what, what, was, what was that kid like that saw that? What was that kid like? Who were you like? I, listen, I was playing accordion. Right. The band that existed since I was, you know, for about two and a half years. And I saw that and I went, oh, yeah. right away. I went, that's, that's my life. That is my life. Now, any musician from my era will tell you the same damn story. It's so boring and cliched, but it was an epiphany. They invented those lads from Liverpool, the modern day rock band. They invented it. There wasn't, it wasn't there. Most rock stars, <clears throat> musicians, were solo singers. They weren't bands. You know, you had the Beach Boys, but the Beach Boys weren't even really playing their instruments in the beginning. There the, there the Beatles are, playing and singing, and the music was so joyous. Uh, and I, I had heard the hype. You, you were too young to know. Then we started with this, the Beatles are coming, the Beatles are coming. This commercial went on for a month or two. And my buddy, he bought <clears throat> the Beatle boots. He bought the single, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Yeah, true. Yeah. And I thought, I didn't like I, I Want to Hold Your Hand. I still don't. I, if that was it, they're not going to get my attention. So we're sitting in my, my mother's front room, as we say here in Chicago. <clears throat> and I want to go to the Sunday night dance where the Catholic school girls are, if you catch my drift. He says, no, we got to stay here. All right, the Beatles. Close your eyes and I'll kiss. That's it. The guy happened. Yeah. Listen to this story. Two weeks later, I go to that same dance. And I met my wife. In 1964, my professional personal life was settled in two weeks. That is something I'm glad I didn't know what had happened. So um, that's a moment. That's why 2-9 back in 64 are the first words of my last album. Because I'm with 26 East, the address of my parents' home, where the nucleus of John, Chuck, and Dennis formed the band in 62. I looked at this always as where, here's where it began, right there in that basement. And here's where it ends. <clears throat> I want to go full circle on it. So I, I went right back to the Beatles. And uh, I wrote that song for the first album. And I was going to get a Julian Lennon to sing with me. And so I was about to contact him. And I read the lyric and I went, mm, no, he wasn't born. It's not his song. So that's the thing that inspired me to go to the piano and write a song called To the Good Old Days, which made it on, on the first album. And, and then I sent that to Julian. I didn't know him, never met him. I just wrote this song and I said, this is something he should do because he hasn't made music in six years. Mm -hmm. He should be making music. I don't care who his dad is. He's got talent. I said it was manager and then Julian contacted me. He said, I love this song. I'll do it. He went up in New York. He sang it. I mixed it there. Just like that. So when you think about it, they had the opportunity to stand in my mother's front room being an accordion player accordion player beetle dreaming that's all and then to do you know a song with, with jewels i don't know how many years later 620 to do that um it doesn't even seem possible but it happened so it's a thrill and um yes the beatles Lennon and McCartney, they're Adam and Eve. 
and the rest of us have begat. You don't have your job right now, and neither do I without them. I swear to you. The impact, all the other bands that followed were trying to beat the Beatles. I just did a thing with John Anderson. We're working on this thing. He's written a song called Everybody Wins. No, Everyone Wins. And I'm going to sing with him. And I sent him the song. And he went, oh, my God, yes, so wonderful. That's exactly who I am. He said him and his brother had gone to see them before the hysteria. And he wanted to be them. You know, no. by the he way, was, I used to think you were British. When I first heard Sticks, I thought I thought you were British. Because when you listen to the Beatles, you thought they were American. Yeah. Yeah. So I was it. They were imitating us. I was imitating them. This is how it works. You know, they're exotic. They're in England. We're exotic. We're in America. And this is all we are. We're a bunch of lemmings jumping off the, you know, going over the side into the water. All we are is, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to um, pay homage and respect to that which inspires us to do stuff. So I used to listen. Um, see, my British accent, what I always call, like I was, said that uh, Styx was a fake prog band. I was a fake Englishman at the same time because I would listen to those old records. I think, okay, he's in and out of, he's in and out of the accent, depending on what word he's saying. But yeah, people thought we were British and um, it helped us in Canada because of all those. All the monarchy. Those, uh, yeah. You know, Proof of heaven. It's, it, you know what? I'm more of a Buddhist dude. I mean, I was raised Roman Catholic. I know you're Roman Catholic. Yeah. I was when I, I talked to Richie Fiore right after uh, Rusty died and I, and I didn't plan this. And I, it's strange, it just blurted out of my mouth. It's kind of like when my brother died, I remember out of nowhere, I opened up his mouth, he's, he's dead, he's on the table. And my mother said, what are you doing? I'm going, I think I'm looking for him. I, why did I just do that? Like, it was weird. Some things, so I'm talking to Richie Fure. I said, where's Rusty? Well, like, I know you're, he's a Christian. And uh, uh, um, John from Orleans, I just did the same thing to him. And I'm going, and then you have this song, Proof of Heaven. And I'm going, well, this is perfect. Dennis DeYoung, where do we go when we die? There's only one question. <clears throat> Why? Why what? What? Why are we here? That's the only question. There are no other questions. You, you answer that one? And here's what I think. You know, I'm not a, as Groucho once said clearly, I don't, you know, I don't want to belong to any club that would have me as a member. This is what I'm afraid of with human beings. They're joiners. You know, we're gregarious. We like to gather. But if the last two years haven't taught, taught us anything, nobody knows nothing. Humanity, wake up. We don't know anything. I mean, here's two, two things. One, there's only one rule. Have I said this? I've said so many interviews that feel like I'm doing the same one. There's only one rule. It's the golden rule. Follow that humanity, things are going to be better. That's number one. Number two, how about this? A little less hubris and a lot more humility. Because if the pandemic hasn't taught us anything, well, then you're just a jack wagon. And it's this. We don't know nothing. That's okay. The, the, here's the sentence I love to read constantly. Scientists were astonished to find well, if these people who are devoting their life to science are astonished every other day. And one more thing, philosophy, you're a Buddhist. Let me get philosophical with you. Well, I'm not so, a Buddhist. I'm Buddhist-like. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's okay. Try Coke Zero, too. So here's the thing. Settled science. Well, there's a Big Bang. Were you there? I wasn't there at the time, John. I, heard, I read about it. I missed it's in, it. In all the papers. Boom. Science was settled. Boom, science is settled. The only problem is human beings don't know what it is because science seems to, seems to be very large. It's a big thing, science. You know, it's very big. And we, we little poodles, you know, we're sniffing and scratching at the surface of it. And um, if we would just say, you know what? It's scary as hell to be a human. Because unlike your dog, who seems to be happy all the time, dogs don't know they're going to die. We do. That's a heavy burden to carry. So all of us are looking for meaning. You, me, all of us. Does, 
that's how I got to be where I am. I got people you know, idolizing me and putting me on pedestals, pedestals I don't belong on. I said it in the Grand Delusion. I said, be careful. Uh, and that's why we joined groups. So this guy's got to know something I don't know. These people that wrote this book, they know that this politician, this religious figure, I'm in a biker gang. I'm in a volleyball club. I bowl on Tuesdays. We're joiners. We're all hoping that somebody knows something to explain why. Yeah. But he's got that answer. Anybody who claims to have it, I don't care who you are, you don't have it. Maybe we'll get it. Maybe if we do get it, we're not going to like it. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. Maybe the mystery of life is better than the reality of it. This is what I'm thinking. But <clears throat> stop already, human beings. And you know what? This thing that we have in our hand now, the power of kings, this phone. An 18th century king doesn't have that much power as yeah. this thing. Hello. We need editors and filters, and we don't have any anymore. So people are going to just shoot their mouths off continually because they can. And what makes it the absolute most destructive thing is we can do it in anonymity, which means <clears throat> without little consequence. And so I think we're getting philosophical now. We have to bring back the fist fight. Go ahead, say something. Go ahead. See, this is what I'm thinking. But when you can say anything you want and you can play into the worst angels in you, people will do this. It's cathartic for them to say, you ain't so much. You're this, you're that. Thin crust pizza, deep this. Thin. I hate the people who like. Yeah. Yeah. This is where Isle of Misanthrope comes from. See how I did that? Write it on the 2060s volume two. Because I watched the political system, the religious systems, all systems failing in real time in the last 24 months with the pandemic. And I said, uh-oh, this is not going well. And I thought, if, if we in this country, because I'm not a Canada by you, you people are nicer and more sensible. Believe me, when all this was going on down here, I kept thinking, you know, Montreal's not that cold. Anyway. <clears throat> I, I, I love the misanthrope as a real journey. That's a, that's a, I, I love, I love that song. You know, I'm looking and I'm saying, have we all become an Isle of misanthropes here? Because are we all hating each other? Are we figuring out ways? What's the best way I can hate that person? Do unto others, back off. By the way, uh, JT Shark asked me, he says, uh, uh, the song, Mr. Roboto. Uh, is that what, how, what, what do you think about the fact that they're doing that song? Do you care after all that's gone down? Who are we talking about? Daft Punk? Uh, Sticks. <laughs> Who? Yeah, you know that, band, that little Tommy band called Sticks? <clears throat> Tommy and JY. Yeah. Um, I would, it, this is like what I, I, it gets back to my point about if you're going to join something, whatever it is, you know, you're going to give your, attention to it uh, to a belief system you might want to do some homework that's all uh, ask around see hey this, well, how did that go um same thing with um the lie that they've been spreading since 1999 when i was sick and they replaced me in the band that this was about mr Roboto. how could it be that was 27 years earlier we had just done 96 and 97 huge re reunion tours 98, we're going to make an album. I got really sick. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Um, but we were recording it. And then they wanted me to uh, agree to a tour. I said, give me six more months. I figured out my eyes were, were damaged from the virus I had. And, I, and I, can't, I can't deal with the light the same way, which makes me fatigued. And it took me forever to figure it out. But listen, when I went to the doctors, when I got this thing, and I said, hey, I lost my sense of taste and smell you know what they said mm. hmm. interesting nobody knew what it was so i am a i'm a long hauler from whatever virus i am to this day i have to wear these all the time anyway i digress so after they they, they decided to replace me sorry there was, sorry sorry let me i'm sorry to interrupt you but you still have do you still have symptoms of that you said you're a long hauler exactly they right if i if i try to go a whole day without my glasses i'll feel like i have chronic fatigue it never went away I only managed it by wearing sunglasses and you ought to see my house. 
<clears throat> everything's draped. Everything has got that that three M stuff you put on your window. It's got to be. I have to live that way. And then I'm okay. Wow. Yeah, and you know what? And that that's okay. No pity days for me. Look behind me. They couldn't tell the story. We replaced a sick colleague because Tommy and I had to get on the road, make some money, and we wanted to control the band. So they made up this. They relitigated bravado. Nobody. Ninety six or seven. We went out and had to, nobody said nothing. The fans didn't go, well, why did you make that song? No, there were like 15,000 people just filled with joy for the music that Sticks had created, as it should be. So they went on and behind the music, which led me to finally sue them and said terrible things about me, both uh, professionally and personally. And I thought, what the, why would you do that? Here's what they, here's what people don't understand. I should say those guys didn't understand. We were a band. Some people had their favorites, but people liked the thing, yeah. right? It was a band. And when you start telling people who loved Mr. Roboto, I just got off an interview. A guy was, he was eight. He said, I became a Sticks fan because of that song. And there's millions of people like that. Okay. If you're going to say something, don't you understand? If you insult any of the music a band makes, there's somebody in the audience who's a fan because of it. So in an effort to somehow cast me in a bad light, they're just harming the band as a whole. Because you've never, you can't find anywhere that I've ever said in my life, oh, that song by Tommy or JY. I don't do that. You want to know why? I don't believe it. I said, we made the music, we made the best we could, and we were a band, we were together. And so for me saying something bad about this one, it says something bad about all of us. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Roboto, so it spent, after spending all this time and energy and every interview that James Young could do uh, and running it down, they add it because you know why? Because it went to number three. It sold a million copies. People love the song. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what your political agenda is. And believe me this when I say this, Tommy Shaw, in 1983, he quit the band on stage during Kilroy at the, uh, in Washington, D.C. And the other three guys were so angry. He quit Sticks. One more time. I'm quitting Sticks. Ah, uh, what? And then the other three guys in the band said, Dennis, let's replace him. They were so mad. They said, we got to replace him. And I went like this. Are you guys aware of how this thing is working? How, what makes this, you know, what, what allows this train to leave the station? I just said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, look, if he wants to make a solo album, let him. Because I believe uh, Styx was mostly the three of us. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Panazos were great. It was a wonderful unit. But the music is always being created by generally speaking, by, by two or three guys, any band you go, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the Who, Pink Floyd, just go down the line. There's always two or maybe three guys that are really making the thing happen. So I said, no, no, I'm not replacing Tommy Shaw. So the fact that now they would bring it back, I don't know, and put it in the first encore position, I guess that speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? How, how, how could I say anything that would add to the fact that words are meaningless, but action is what counts? So they put it back in. And I know why, because I've had people tell me why. You know, this is, this is not that big of a business. Um, people want to hear the songs they love. Yeah. It's just that simple. And once again, if you started out as a Sticks fan early on and you thought Roboto or Babe or any, pick any, any she cares, any song you, you think uh, doesn't meet your expectations, I say, well, the catalog, the complexity of Sticks' music, which Babe, Boat on the River, Mr. Roboto, uh, Midnight Ride, uh, you see what I'm saying? Renegade. And when, so when people say, Oh, I don't like sticks. I hate sticks. 
I, I think you don't like a lot of styles of music, apparently, or yeah. and three different singers. It's just they're responding to a like a, a brand name that they have been said, you're not cool to like that band. And I think to myself, well, you're not cool either, kid. Because <laughs> I'll tell you right now, all the people that I knew who were really cool, they're dead or in jail and you don't qualify. Okay, you get a call right now. Yeah. One more question about that. And you know what's coming. Okay. My bag's packed. If, if, would you go? Hey, my bags are packed. They've been packed for the last 20 years. I just, just this last year, through back channels, you know, the people who put up the money to say, welcome sticks to wherever you are. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Montreal, London. Those people went back channels and said, hey, because everybody knows what that would mean. And uh, I, I was told that Tommy said no. And I, my thing has been this. I don't want to be back in the band, Johnny. I don't want to be back in the band. I want to do one last tour for the fans. Okay. Denny wants to go and say, hey, man, thank you. Look, look at the life you have given me. Because this is a fact. You ain't sh without those people. You're in your basement still trying to figure out your ass from a hole in the ground. The fans are the what? That's it. They make the difference. And I just want to say thanks and go, I know why you liked it. Here it is. The way it was done when you were 25 pounds lighter and had twice as much hair. <laughs> What's your thought on, uh, on Gowan, Larry Gowan? I mean, he's, I, 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 a, I wouldn't have taken that gig because I mean, he's a great singer. He's a nice guy, but but what's your thoughts on him? I've said this a million times. Larry Gowan's the very best Larry Gowan on the planet. No one's a better Larry Gowan than Larry. I'm the best Dennis DeYoung still to this day. And if anybody confuses, uh, you know, playing, you can play anything. Players, dime a dozen. You know, I don't mean players originality but copying somebody i just saw a four-year-old japanese girl doing all of eddie van halen's solos in her bedroom you can you can get people to play they're a dime a dozen they really are but singers they got dna baby they got dna and if you confuse me vocally with larry i i, I would be perplexed lady when you're with me i'm smiling Give me one of your love. Yeah. Excuse me. Welcome to the grand illusion. Come on in and see. Are you being serious? So Larry, he, he took the job. He knew what he was getting into. And he's got a great, he, he, he wears it well. He gets it. He's not a denier. He never has been. In fact, I, I know people on the inside who have told me Larry wanted to play Mr. Roboto 20 years ago. Mm. Larry has said it. Well, it's because he liked it when it first came out. And he's not in that, I got to belong to a political party. I have to have this dogma, you know, or this ideology. No. He says, hey, why don't we play that? That's good. Um, so Larry's the best Larry Gow, and nobody even comes close to me as Dennis Dio. I search high and high and high and wide for that kid who appears on YouTube that just nails me. I haven't seen him. A couple of people get close. But, you know, when I first heard my, my voice, I went, I hate that voice. That voice. Yeah, but everyone <laughs> says that. I didn't sound like I wanted. I, this is that person I wanted to sound like. I don't. Yeah. I, th that's not good. Well, maybe. Good as a, that's too subjective, but what it is is unique. Yeah. You don't have, yeah, that, that's, that's not subjective. That is objective. That guy doesn't sound like anybody else, and I still hate him. But you can say that, right? You say, because listen, no offense, Rush is a great band. Now all the Canadians are going to jump up and down, but, you know, Getty's wonderful. They're great musicians. 
you know, they got a great fan base, very loyal. I've did a lot of shows with Rush, but you know, Getty's voice, like Tom Waits, Joe Cocker, you could go right, Mick Jagger, people's tastes and vocalists is very, very subjective. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, wait a minute. Like, uh, I'll ask you this. I ask everyone this. Did your parents get it? Did your parents get what you were doing? Did they see your success? My mother wanted She made me play accordion. She was Italian. It was the, it was the, it was the law. Um, but my mother was a taskmaster. Nothing or nobody was ever good enough. Yeah. This is her friend. My, my dad was easy going. But you, there's always that one parent. I don't, I don't know who it is in your family. I, and if you want me to listen to you talk about it, it's 200 an hour and lay on the couch. <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, one of them made you feel like, you know, <clears throat> you weren't going to be good enough. Yeah, of course, yes. That's why human beings do everything. We have, we have architecture. We have motion pictures. We have good food. Because someone was trying to please somebody who, who, who wouldn't be pleased. Am I wrong? Yeah. You want to say, well, music was, the, oh, that was just the vehicle you chose. Yeah. That's it. I hit this baseball because my dad didn't think it was any good. I sucked. This is fundamentally humanity. We all are searching for love and the approval we don't think we're getting. Am I wrong? I don't even need your approval. I know it's correct. Because like I said, in 1977, so if you think your life is complete confusion because you never win the game, just remember it's a grand illusion. And deep inside, we're all the same. We're all the same. We are human beings. Did, did you get that kind of feedback? Did people get that song? Because I remember really paying attention to those lyrics because I was about, I was 17 then uh, when that came out. Uh, did, you must have got feedback on that song because you that's kind of a straight shooter song. I mean, I, I kind of got that. Well, I told everybody we're an illusion. Yeah. What band did that? I said, welcome to the Grand. Look at us. We're up here in the light, blah, blah, blah. But don't be fooled by the radio. I told them, <clears throat> we are the perfect example of the illusion we create for capitalism to sell you something. We are selling you albums, CDs, concert tickets, T-shirts. But I said, it's okay because we do this because we need, we need the illusions because we all know we're going to die. Please give me something to look at to make me happy until that happens. This is what I'm doing. I'm saying, oh, look at that guy. And did people know? I don't think so. And remember when Sticks finally hit it, 77, boom, everybody over the world knew we were. It was the height of the punk explosion, 76, 77. And every jack wagon writer who knows nothing about anything, and I mean that, heard the style of the music we were playing. And so they could be dismissive because we weren't Johnny Rotten. And now, did they ever look back and, and did they ever say to themselves, well, Malcolm McLaren or whatever the hell his name is, Malcolm, whatever. The no, guy Malcolm who put McLaren, yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. Now, he put it together as a joke, as a laugh, as they say in, in, in Great Britain. And everyone goes, hey, Okay, here's my premise. I'm going to tell you right now. What do I care what people think? Go back. Let's get Chuck Berry. Let's go get Little Richard. Let's go get Elvis. <clears throat> Jerry Lee, he's still breathing. How is that possible? We go get all of them, all the people that, you know, Bo Diddley, Carl Perk, any everyone who created this thing, and bring them in to watch Johnny Rotten and think, boy, this thing's got out of hand. We never intended that to happen. <laughs> Don't tell me they wouldn't say that. Yeah. And they weren't. And the bolt that these writers have shoved down our throats about, it's about the establishment and, and, and protest and, and it's against the man. And that's what these early rockers were doing. Of course, who? Elvis was a mama's boy who wanted to buy his mama a Cadillac. Chuck Berry wanted to buy a Cadillac and get the cash. The American dream. Well, there is a thing that and, and it can be earned young, but it doesn't usually happen as far as just saying, this is me. I either like something, I don't like it, I, but this is just, you know, that's a thing that usually has to come with age. But how far, how far does it go back with you? Were you going, I'm Dennis DeYoung, this is who I am? No, uh, that's, that was, that's developed over a period of time. When Lady Failed the first time it came out in 1973, I, I thought, oh, gee, because that Sticks 2 album, which eventually went gold, 
uh, there was only seven songs. We have proggy, like, because there were a couple eight minute tracks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Five of them were mine. And it was just a huge stiff and no one played Lady Hardly. I thought, well, they hate me. You know, this is surprised my by that. That song from start to finish, just to me, that's like a, a perfect song. No, I, I listen, you're young. It's the first time you do something. And uh, Lady was the first time, song I ever sang and wrote by myself on an album. And people go, eh, meh. okay, nobody plays it. You go, well, because we're all like you. You have a, a great facade. You pretend you know something. You got a good look, right? Inside, you're going, I hope I don't suck. This is what humans are. Yeah. You know, we, we're 50% bravado, 50% insecurity. Um, so I, I thought, well, I suck. And so on the second the album after that was uh, um, Serpent is Rising. I wrote a song about a pirate. I mean, I was doing anything. Hey, love me. And then but, Lady but didn't you think they were, wasn't there a part of you though? Because that song has really stood the test of time. Wasn't there a part of you that thought maybe they're wrong? You don't want to be around me during 73 and four because <clears throat> I had the misfortune of watching the crowds we played in front of go nuts for Lady and like the rest of the stuff. Go nuts for Lady and like the rest of the stuff. So I thought, well, they seem to like it. What, what, what's the disconnect? So I, I would talk to the record company and think, well, my manager would say in his stupidity, if it was a hit record, your record company would have made it a hit record. And I would go, hey, but come to the concerts, come to the sock ops, whatever we're doing to get, they, they like it. What happened? And, and, and then when it happened by accident in November 74, when WLS started playing lady when they didn't have any reason to yeah. yeah and it became a hit i said oh I, I i spent a little time going like this i told you so you jack wagons not because i knew it okay not because i'd never written hit records so how would i know what it was but i just knew it because you know, the other the audience said so so i went oh <laughs> sticks two goes go oh they don't hate me. I felt like Sally Fields. They like me. So anyway, Equinox, eight songs. I take over overtly. No, but everybody knew. The Young has said this was the deal three years ago. Turns out to be the deal. <laughs> so Equinox, eight songs. I sing lead in seven. And I'm involved in the writing of every song but one. That's me going, this is what we should be doing. Equinox. So I sound like I'm bragging. I'm just stating the facts and the truth. I'm insecure. I didn't know what I was doing. And you say, didn't you? Know? I didn't know. I only knew what the audience said to me. But after Lady was a hit, then I knew. I said, oh, this is what they like about me and the band. Let's do that. That seems like a pretty good plan. The last Guitar Hero is doing really, really well as far as streaming. I know streaming is a whole other topic, but uh, that is a great song. Uh, real good rocker. Tell me about that one. Uh, Jim had the idea, Jim Peter. <clears throat> That's one of the four songs he wrote on this 12. He, he and I wrote together, I should say. He said, I got this idea, Dan. Last Guitar Hero. I said, brilliant. And then he wrote the lyrics. And they were more about, they were very musician-centric. Jim likes writing about being a musician and being in the business. I hate it. I don't write that stuff. You already know. I, if, you, if I have to identify who I am to you, my music sucks. So um, <clears throat> I don't. And I said, Jim, yes, yes. But what if it was just a metaphor for the larger picture of technology and it's ever forward march of replacing humans? Then I love that idea. And he came up with this riff. So we sat in the, just the two of us, like, you know, Lennon McCartney, <laughs> as if. So there we are facing each other and going, yeah, no, and I'm singing, and then we're playing, and then this, and there's that chord, song. Then, that was written three years ago. So now, yeah, because I was going to put it on, we were all these songs. Right. So they said, <clears throat> who's the last guitar hero? And I thought, well, maybe Morello, because he's the last one to do something unique. You know, a lot of guys can play notes. But he did something different. Uh, maybe him. And I had met him at an Adam Sandler uh Hanukkah Shindig 
uh, Christmas party. He came up to me, told me he was a Sticks fan. I went, <laughs> and you know, I saw Paradise Theater. I saw Kilroy was here. I like Roboto. I said, he should have been one of the guitar players in our band. So I think, well, do I ask him? So I just sheepishly, as he puts it, said, hey, man, you remember me? He said, yeah. Um, w- w- you, would you play? He said, send me the song. I sent him the song. I love it. He played. I mixed it. That's all there is to it. But, uh, you know, when Tom Morello, six notes in, it's him. I sing four notes. It's me. Okay. You don't have to like me, but you go, oh, I hate that guy. But that's me. And that's Tom. And, uh, you know, he, he elevated the song by the mere, by the sheer, by his playing. But it is a song about what point the human beings make bargains with the technology, all the little smarty pants in the Silicon Valley or hiding in a basement in Russia or you're, you're being paid by the state, by the Chinese. Who knows? They're creating all this stuff with no thought of the law of unintended consequences. Steve Dorsey, you know him? Who need, isn't he the guy that did Twitter? Isn't that his name? Who needs it? How does that help mankind? It has not. It's made it worse. It's, it's just a, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a, a force for stupidity. People say, you on uh, Twitter? I says, no, because I hate the taste of shoe leather. I don't need my own foot in my mouth. <clears throat> so, and Marky Mark Zuckerberg, I say this all the time. What was his mission? His mission goal was to connect everyone. Mark, have you met everyone? <laughs> you want to connect them? You better get you better get out more. That was my, <laughs> Glass Guitar Hero says, okay, this all this stuff designed to make our life. Here's the whole problem with global warming, climate change, whatever, whatever suits your needs today, you stupid ass, as if as if a rose by any other name wouldn't still smell like a funeral. Here's what I say about that. Climate change. I think it's being made worse by all the hot air coming out of people's mouths. Forget about cow farts. I think it's that. So I I, I look at the world right now and and more than ever, I never thought I'd say this, especially about the United States of America. I'm scared. I'm concerned that people are willing to believe the lies they like. This is human nature. If I told you you're the best looking, smartest interviewer I've ever had in my life, you're not going to argue with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what's going on. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the lies li- they like. Wow. I've never put that. I've never heard it put that way. Yeah. The grand illusion uh, that that whole, I remember, I remember when I, and I had the other albums, when I got that album, I remember thinking, Oh God, this is important now. This is even more important now. That's the stupid things that come in, in the 17 year old's head. But what was the vibe going into that album for you guys? You guys knew you were onto something. No, uh, I think you, you never, you never know nothing. I said, people now, all these years later, fans come up, Facebook, social media, Dennis, your, your music, how it changed my life. It made this to me, just like you just said, I hear it all the time. And I think to myself, how did that happen? I went, I was just trying to kick Aerosmith's ass. I wanted to beat Queen. That's what I was thinking I was going to do. I pushed the band. <clears throat> I said, the grand delusion. What about this idea? Of, and then I said, pieces of eight. What about the, the thought that we all made a lot of money in the last year? What does it mean to us? I was the guy. I was Dr. Seuss. I was trying to think the big think, you know, and uh, grand delusion. I said, not, I, I got the title from the, uh, the French um, anti-war movie, not the content, just the, the title. I said, is, aren't we all illusions? We're just creating this. And, I, and then I t- talked to him about it. And then we did the songs and you're doing them. It was, you know, a grand illusion for a song written, which is why that's the worst mix on the album. Cause it was the first one we did it right away. And I wasn't sure how to mix it. I hate the way it sounds. Oh, now everyone's going to say, Dennis, don't tell me that. I love it. The song is wonderful. It's, it, 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 it's just not right for me. My go, oh, listen, how good fooling yourself, son. This is what I think. So that, Come Sail Away, and Man in the Wilderness, first three songs written. And then when it was all done, I can tell you, here's a soundbite. When I was at the album party, 
listening to the whole record in its entirety, blaring through the speakers. My good friend at the time, Tom, friend at the time, Tom Short, stood next to me. I looked at Tom, you know, come say away, played ending. I looked at him, I said, if that doesn't make us superstars, I'm, I won't be capable of it. I, I thought, if that doesn't do it, you know, because we were doing good, but we were always everyone's bridesmaid. Oh, opening for Aerosmith and ZZ and Seeger and Kiss and whoever the hell it is. But never the, the cross the board. Head. I said, that doesn't do it. Nothing will do it. Well, it did it. That was my feeling about the Grand Illusion. I said, boy, this is this is a grand album we've created here. Well, we'll come sail away. That's uh, another song that obviously, I mean, that is such a, it's welcome to, speaking of grand, that's such a, and, and by the way, you didn't consider yourself a prog band. There was there's so much proggy stuff in there. It's, it's, a, it's a piano ballad for two minutes. No, no, I mean, not necessarily that song, but like the band itself. But Come Sail Away. What keeps we're an American, that tune? We're an American rock band. And we had martial amps. <laughs> we like to pose and go out there. And we were an American rock and roll band who stole some proggy ideas and stuck it in there. I mean, we were prog like. And if you go to prog uh, sites where all these people who are obsessed with time signatures and, and key changes and lyrics you can't understand, if you live to be a thousand, is that poetry? Write a poem. This is a song. Tell me something. Oh, man, are people hating me now? But proggers, I call them prognoggins. It's the facade of white European music combined with some jazz and, and some rock. That's what they love. That's good for you. We're an American rock and roll band. Here's a blues guitar solo. How many blues guitar solos are there in any in any prog music, very few, right? Am I wrong about that? I haven't listened to it all, but I listened to a lot. In fact, they just pulled out Court of the Crimson King, which is what I was listening to when we made our first album. And I thought, oh yeah, <clears throat> listen to Court of the Crimson King. And then listen to 21st Century Schizoid. Not the part that goes on forever when it sounds like they were, that they were drunk or high, you know, noodling for like three minutes. So I'm gonna go like this. <laughs> Life's, too short. Life's too short and misanthrope. Listen to the, the plaintiveness of the Isle of Misanthrope. But, and then, um, 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 that right? Is that 21st century? Yeah. Accidentally, I just went, I didn't even think about it. When I, was, I thought I was rewriting Sweet Madam Blue. That's what I thought I was doing. And then I went, well, maybe that, that, that has, there's some similarities there. So anyway, yeah, I like Prague in the beginning. But when it becomes about your noodling and your astral projections, I want a song. Genesis. I know what I like and I like what I know. Or Dancing with the Moonland Night. Give me the songs. Okay, give me, give me Selling England. Uh, it, 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 give me Lucky Man. Give me all good people. Topographic oceans. I said, hey, yes. Uh, you left me at the bottom of the ocean. I don't know what's going on. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's for the same reason I don't like, I love some jazz, but most of it I go, you spend a lot of time in your bedroom. I get it. <laughs> Paradise Theater. Uh, that's the first time I saw you guys. Um, now, at that point, you guys must, I mean, th this is a successful band going in to record that album. I remember it was laser etched. It was really cool. I, um uh, what was the vibe going into that album? I got kicked out of the band because Babe went to number one on the album before because I'd kind of fooled with the, the style a little bit. And then uh, the record company thought that first time was going to be another number one record for us. They wanted to release it. And then Tommy threatened to quit the band if it was released. He threatens a lot on that stuff. And, uh, and then there was a big brouhaha of, between us, all of us. I ended up getting kicked out because I, I couldn't take any more. You know, you, you write a number one song, have a People's Choice Award for it. You're the band of the year. <clears throat> and you should be somehow, you know. So anyway, I came back to the band and I had to follow certain guidelines. This is true. They wanted to tour more. Well, well we toured. We didn't tour as much in 79 because my wife was pregnant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, want, I said I'll do these 90 to 100 shows, but I need time off for the baby to be born. Coincidentally, my son was born with complications at birth 
when at the same time, Tommy was uh, threatening to quit the band over a song the record company wanted to release. So I come back and what do I do? I come up with the concept of the Paradise Theater album and the tour and the janitor. And the first song we release is Best of Times, which is a ballad. It goes to number three. I'll, I'll let you figure that out for yourself. But, um, you know, uh, Paradise Theater was never a better stick show than that. Never. It'll be, it's in your memory as one of the best concerts you ever saw because it was, it was just enough theater. And then those guys could play those songs and they could do them live. Yeah. Got it, find it. That's it. Go listen, go right now to YouTube. There's two videos up. You can listen. All the music's up. You can decide for yourself. Go to my Facebook page, not my website. I write everything on that Facebook page. That's no bot, no stooges that I hire. And so if you like me here, which I, I don't know if you do or not, uh, come and follow me. We'll have fun. As I've said before, follow me on Facebook, but not into the men's room. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that. Dennis DeYoung, what a guy. What a great lead singer he was. He's still doing his shows. But I think he's missed in sticks. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. Buy a t-shirt. The links are in the description. If you want to donate to the channel, there are links there too. Or you can join our Patreon, get early access to our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rocky Stream Music. Take care. <laughs>